into the mysterious world of point of care ultrasound and cardiac arrest. So today I want you to leave here feeling confident about how to use point of care ultrasound at your next arrest and being aware of the limitations that it actually has in that setting and what the evidence actually tells us about that. In the second half of the talk, I hope to introduce you to the idea of ED-based transesophageal point of care ultrasound and to maybe demystify transesophageal echo for you and to discuss how we might implement it here at TOH. So there's a couple of things we're not going to cover. So I'm not going to teach you how to generate views. Uh, to do that, you really got to go out and like, actually get some hands-on time and take a course. I think it would kind of be a waste of time and grand rounds to do that. Uh, we're not going to talk about procedural guidance for things like pericardiocentesis. Um, despite my interest in trauma, we're not actually going to talk at all about traumatic arrest, uh, although I think Britt's doing that uh, in a couple of weeks. And uh, we're not going to talk about peri-arrest and shock, because I think Brandon did a great job covering that uh, in April 2015. Uh, so I do have some disclosures. Well, actually, no, I don't actually technically have any disclosures. I think that's pretty clear just from looking at me. <laughs> I'm clearly not being paid for by the ultrasound lobby. Although I should confess, I did try to patent a homemade TEE that just didn't really take off. I couldn't get the patent for it, so it just didn't work out. It's, it's not going to be an hour of that. I promise. I, promise. Uh, I do have some other disclosures. I don't, despite like, the nature of the talk and the title of the talk, I don't consider myself uh, an invasivist. I'm not here to try and sell you on point of care ultrasound or transesophageal echo because it's new or because it's advanced or because it somehow makes me like a magical space cowboy on the leading edge of medical innovation. No. I think as emergency care providers, there's a million and one things we need to do to tighten up our care of cardiac arrest patients besides introducing new advanced resuscitation techniques. But that said, I do think ultrasound is like a ubiquitous technology with tremendous uptake. Uh, and I think if we incorporate this well into cardiac arrest, there's a chance to do some real good by our patients. So if you're a really seasoned echo guru, a lot of this might just be superfluous to you. I don't think there's anything I could do to convince you to not drag a probe to a cardiac arrest. And if you're a staunch opponent of ED POCUS, it would be easy to take a lot of points I'm saying in this talk as evidence against the use of our ultrasound and cardiac arrest. I can only ask that you just try to keep an open mind here today. But if you're in the middle and you just want to know, hey, how can I use POCUS to, next, to best care for my cardiac arrest patient, then hopefully this is the talk for you. So to get us in the mood, let's start with the case. Uh, pretend you're working general recess and you get a patch call. So it's a 61-year-old lady uh, for a code ROSC. So this is a real case that happened uh, to me a couple months ago. She was at Rotel with her husband. She had a brief episode of epigastric pain, and then she syncopized. And she didn't get any bystander CPR. When EMS arrived there, her initial rhythm was PEA. They applied a Lucas and got access using an IO. And luckily, they actually had ROSC with EMS after uh, ACLS for six minutes and just two rounds of epi. And she's brought to the general ED. They're rolling her in. You see on the portable monitor, she's in a narrow complex tachycardia at about 100 beats per minute. You know, they hand you the 12 lead ECG that they did. It's pretty nonspecific. Certainly, there's no STEMI. And as they're about to transfer her to recess two, she loses her pulse again. So CPR is restarted. She's given one of epi, and you see that she's in a PEA narrow complex at 40. So at your first pulse check, one of your residents actually puts the ultrasound on the probe and shows you looking for cardiac activity. And this is what you see. So the question is, this isn't an all too unfamiliar scenario. The question is, what do you do with that information? How does it actually change your arrest management? So you know that resuscitating a code is hard. You know, you're waiting for family members to come in to give more collateral. You have two or three people on with fingers on central pulses. Two are saying they don't have it. One is saying they might. As a merge docs, you're used to making decisions quickly with incomplete information and getting the job done without the whole story. But don't you sometimes wish you had just like a little more information? I think it goes without saying that transthoracic echo has changed the way that we resuscitate ill patients. It's helped us be more focused and targeted in our treatment decisions, and ECHO is becoming the standard of care for resuscitating these patients, whether it's looking at ventricular function, uh, lung fields are really taking off for looking at CHF, uh, looking at the IVC for fluid responsiveness. But what do you do once the patient has actually kind of gone down the crapper? Like, what's the role of ultrasound and cardiac arrest? How can it help you with your wish list of things you want to know? So I think it would be a lot to start making assessments of you know, wall motion and abnormalities to diagnose MI and infarct. But what about that other big question that seems to come up whenever you have a PEA arrest? Does this patient have a pulmonary embolism, and should I give them lytics? So we know that PE is found to be the cause of about 4.8% of cardiac arrests. 
And of these, the initial rhythm seems to be PEA in about 63%, asystole in 32%, and the smattering of VFib about 5%. And why does this matter? Why is it important to figure out early? Well, in a retrospective study of 1,246 arrest patients, 60 of whom were confirmed to have PE, they found that early thrombolytics were shown to result in a significantly higher rate of ROSC as 81 versus 43%. So now, these aren't eMERGE studies, but it's looking at the utility of ECHO overall for diagnosing PE. So this is, you know, a total between these four studies of 347 patients with suspected PE that were ultimately found to have it on angiography or CTPE. Now, I, I give you it's totally a wide range for that sensitivity there. And even within these studies, there's significant variation in what constitutes RV dilatation or RV dysfunction or RV strain. And what about in the ED itself? There was a recent prospective study of 146 patients that got POCUS performed by an ED physician for the prediction of pulmonary embolus for people that were moderate to high probability. This time, they actually defined RV dilatation in advance and RV di dysfunction as well. And 15 of 17 positive ultrasound studies ended up having a PE. There's two false positives, both of whom were COPDers. Now, it's not a perfect study. You know, it was a convenient sample from a single site. And there's some obvious confirmation bias. But I guess it's a start, right? But start to what? You know, these numbers aren't all that great. And in stable patients, is it possible we're missing up to 50% of PEs with echo? The thinking is that in unstable patients, it might be more useful. And the 2014 European guidelines for the management of PE state, in patients with suspected high-risk PE presenting with shock or hypotension, the absence of echo signs of RV overload practically excludes PE as a cause of instability. And then they go on to say, conversely, unequivocal signs of RV overload in a compromised patient with suspected PE are highly evocative and might justify the use of aggressive treatment, so they're saying lytics, for people if bedside tools must suffice. So they're saying if they're too unstable for the scanner. So unfortunately, the former statement, they provide no reference at all. And the latter, the only reference is a small European study which incorporated a formal transthoracic echo by cardiologists. And the 2011 AHA guidelines basically say the same thing. And the problem is, this is all for people that you already have suspected PE, not an undifferentiated PEA arrest. And unfortunately, there's so many false positives for RV strain, many of which have a high prevalence in our sick or cardiac arrest patients in the emergency department. Whether this is undiagnosed or not, we, we're seeing people with right-sided MIs. We're seeing people with obstructive lung disease, people with pulmonary hypertension, as Talia told, Talia told us about a few weeks ago, and even left-sided valve disease. So long story short, there's no good evidence that we can reliably diagnose PE in cardiac arrest patients using trans, transthoracic echo. That said, expert opinion is that in an arrest setting, if there's RV dilatation or dysfunction without an alternative cause on your first point of care ultrasound, that's probably enough ammo to pull the trigger on lytics. But you need to be wary of false positives in both the peri-arrest and arrest settings. So we're going to move on to another common application of ultrasound during cardiac arrest, one that I think a lot of you are already using. And this is the idea of pseudo-PEA. It's a popular term. I imagine most of the residents have heard of it. Have the staff heard of this term as well, pseudo-PEA? It's the idea that you can't palpate a pulse or a central pulse, but they have organized cardiac activity. So it's distinct from a true PEA in that there's no, a true PEA has like electrical activity, but with no mechanical activity. They call that electromechanical dissociation. Whereas a pseudo-PEA, there actually is activity there. So as it turns out, we're actually pretty terrible at palpating pulses. You know, how many of you have been doing a pulse check and even you're not really sure if there's a pulse there or not? And how many of you have stood at bedside watching someone feel a pulse and there's, a mold, there's multiple people checking and there's a lack of agreement between them? If you're like me, you're sort of a Brian Elder type and you have, you know, calluses in your fingers from playing guitar, you might not feel anything at all. There's a study done by Tibbles and Russell that demonstrated amongst 209 ACLS providers, that's doctors and nurses, that rescuer pulse palpation was only 78% accurate. And ACOA found that 43% of nurses and doctors were slow to detect a carotid pulse, even in perfectly healthy, normotensive volunteers. So POCUS has an opportunity here to provide a superior tool for assessing the presence of cardiac activity. Simply put the probe on the chest and look. So this is a case uh, given from Rebel EM. This is a video of a relatively young patient. She was thought to be in PEA arrest as determined by two rescuers palpating for a pulse. She had a narrow complex rhythm on the monitor and they thought no palpable blood pressure. I think most of you would agree that this actually shows organized cardiac activity, right? I don't think that's like an equivocal or you're waffling on it. So a femoral arterial line for this lady was placed with ultrasound guidance, of course. 
And it's showing a blood pressure of 48 on 22. And then you realize she's not actually in cardiac arrest. This is just extreme shock. And we know that a milligram of epinephrine can be harmful to patients with a pulse, leading to hypertension or dysrhythmia, to say nothing of needless chest compressions. So this is a patient who might benefit instead from an epinephrine drip, and that's what she got. Her MAP improved along with her mental status, and this patient had a good outcome. This is sort of the classic scenario where POCUS can help us make an accurate decision and avoid harmful interventions. And what about when EMS brings you a patient that's in asystole, and in the chaos of a code, you look up at the monitor, the patient's being moved around, and this is what you see. It would be easy, especially if you're already primed by EMS, to think that this is asystole, but when you do your pulse check, it turns out they're actually in fine V-fib, which you can see with an ultrasound. Now, this guy needs electricity for any chance of ROSC. Some of you, you know, the more astute ones of you, probably picked up on the fact that the monitor strip I showed you was probably fine V-fib from the get-go. But this is an example where clinical skills can save your ass, basically, and save someone's life. But I don't think it's impossible for any one of us to make that same mistake, especially if you're already primed by EMS. And POCUS will give you that cue to reconsider your diagnosis. Put another way, nobody wants to be the guy that gets caught with a pseudo-asystole. So admittedly, these are extreme examples. You know, a more common scenario might be when you look and you actually see a complete standstill. You know, there might be some blood looking, going through the heart or some you know, quick fluttering of valve motion, but there's the complete absence of ventricular wall motion. I know many of you are already practicing in such a way that this is seen as a justification for stopping resuscitation. But what does the evidence actually tell you about this finding of standstill in cardiac arrest? Blythe et al. published a systematic review in academic emergency medicine in 2012. Some of you might be familiar with this. There was eight articles included in the final analysis, 568 patients, all of whom had echo performed by emergency physicians or residents during cardiac arrest, and then were followed up to determine ROSC. She found that 2.4% of patients with standstill subsequently went on to achieve ROSC. And the likelihood of ROSC increased substantially to 52% if cardiac activity was seen. Now, it should also be noted there was an outlier study which, for various reasons, had a significantly higher rate of ROSC, even with cardiac standstill. If you actually exclude that trial, and maybe that's playing with the data a little bit, the number for the latter number there for cardiac standstill is actually closer to 1%. So what are some of the takeaways from this? The absolute absence of cardiac activity is pretty effective, but it's not definitive for guiding the failure of ROSC. In circumstances where the prior probability of survival is high, so if it's a witness arrest, they got early CPR, it was a short downtime, a negative echo can't be relied on to predict eventual death with certainty. And echo is a weak predictor of ROSC, never mind survival. But you can use these likelihood ratios I put up here to adjust your expectations based on existing factors about the case. Now, yes, I admit, there's limitations in all eight of those studies. There's significant heterogeneity. There's different definitions of what constitutes cardiac activity. And keep in mind, like I said, this is just for ROSC. That's not a patient-centered outcome. You, know? you have to ask yourself, has anyone actually looked at survival outcomes for these patients? And this is where we enter the REASON study. So this was a non-randomized, non-blinded, prospective trial. It was a convenient sample of 953 emergency department, department patients with non-traumatic cardiac arrest 793 of whom were eventually included. And you'll note our very own Mike Wu was one of the investigators, as TOH was one of the sites. So their primary uh, outcome was survival to admission, and some of their secondary outcomes were survival to discharge and ROSC. You needed to receive at least one round of ACLS drugs. In fact, if you didn't, those patients were excluded, as were patients who had their code terminated early. Patients received an initial ultrasound and then repeated exams during pulse checks using a parasternal view or sub xiphoid view. Those are, the, I would say, probably the two ones we use most commonly in an arrest. So the results, by looking at the graph here, the black bars are people that had cardiac activity, the gray bars are people that didn't. They found a statistically significant difference in ROS, statistically significant difference for survival to admission and survival to discharge. And their conclusions were that the presence of cardiac activity on ultrasound is the variable most associated with survival at any time, even more so than bystander CPR. So the authors speculate that at least some of the survival comes from finding other ways to intervene, whether that's putting a needle in the pericardium or lytics, or simply maybe just that it prolongs resuscitative efforts, leading to what looks like better outcomes. Similar to the prior meta-analysis I showed you, they also note that lack of cardiac activity cannot predict with futility, cannot predict with certainty the futility of arrest, as 0.6% of patients with standstill still left the hospital. That's five patients with no ventricular wall motion still survived to discharge. But they do suggest, based on their subgroup analysis, that lack of activity and asystole 
for an unwitnessed arrest would predict futility with 100% sensitivity. So the trial wasn't powered for that, but it passes the sniff test, as they say, because asystole and no bystander CPR are already known bad prognostic factors. So as before, it seems that POCUS can guide resuscitative treatment decisions and also give us an idea who will not survive a discharge. Unfortunately, since it was an unfunded, unfunded study done completely on the investigator's own time, there's no data on neuro outcomes. And again, there's pretty significant limitations. There's potential bias from the lack of unblinding. It's a pragmatic study. And there's selection bias in terms of who was enrolled. So my takeaway for using transthoracic echo in cardiac arrest is that POCUS is a useful tool to adjust the probability of ROSC. But you have to use it in context of other prognostic factors like whether or not it was witnessed, whether or not they got bystander CPR. And you can't definitively rule out ROSC with standstill, although the number is probably somewhere between 1 and 3%. And just keep in the back of your mind, if there is cardiac activity for a PEA arrest, your chance of ROSC could be as high as 50%. So now let's look at some other attempts to assess the utility of the routine incorporation of POCUS into ACLS protocols and how it might make a difference for our patients. Has this ever happened to you, where someone asks you to, ha to do something, but they give you essentially no idea how to actually do it? That's how a lot of people feel about ACLS. That's how I feel about ACLS sometimes. You know, they stress the H H's and T's as possible causes of cardiac arrest, or PEA arrest. You know, consider the H's and T's. Treat the H's and T's. But they don't actually tell you how to do that. They don't provide a framework for that management. Hopefully, even in the absence of the arrow sign up there, you can sort of reflexively appreciate what's going on there. It's a clip from a pericardial effusion cause, causing tamponade and complete collapse of the right ventricle. Now, how many people in here have actually used ultrasound to supplement a clinical diagnosis of tamponade before? Yeah, a lot of people. And I phrased that very deliberately. Did you notice that? I didn't just say who's seen tamponade and ultrasound. It's to supplement your clinical diagnosis. So it's not just looking for an effusion, it's looking for like those other physiological and ultrasound parameters of tamponade. We know it's a potential cause of shock and arrest. And we've already talked about one of the other T's, that's the thrombosis, comma, pulmonary. But does routine use of ultrasound actually change anything when running these codes? From a service evaluation review at Dalhousie of their cardiac arrests of patients that received ultrasound, they found that 12% of those patients had an intervention performed as a direct result of the scan. And that's including pericardiocentesis, thrombolytics, and even a chest strain. Similarly, in a consensus statement by the American Society of Echocardiography and ASEP, Labovitz said that the identification of causes of PEA arrest with focused cardiac ultrasound with zero or minimal interruption in CPR improves outcomes by de decreasing time to treatment and return of spontaneous circulation. He then goes on to provide four separate references for the statement, but if you actually go through it, not a single one of them actually supports the statement that he makes. But I get why people want to believe in this. It makes sense. It seems like a no-brainer, right? If you can see the heart, shouldn't you be able to resuscitate it more effectively than if you're just doing it blindly? That's why over the past 10 years, several protocols have been uh, proposed incorporating POCUS into ACLS. There's been a couple. There's been the focused echocardiographic evaluation and resuscitation. There's the focused echocardiographic evaluation and life support. And then the cardiac arrest ultrasound examination. And the name is supposed to remind you that you're looking for causes, so that's why they named it that. I think that guy should get like total points just for naming it that, because the cause exam would be amazing. So let's look at the, most, uh, the study that's the most often quoted for support of using POCUS in ACLS. This is actually a German prospective observational study in a pre-hospital emergency setting, so keep that in mind. It's 230 patients undergoing active CPR, 204 of which uh, received the field protocol I showed you earlier. And that's performed by a quote-unquote emergency physician, but that, that actually includes over there cardiologists, internists, surgeons, anesthetists, pediatrics, all you need to have is a fellowship in EMS to be included in the study as an emergent physician. Now, 75% of their patients had cardiac activity, so that's 75% of patients had that pseudo-PEA. And the total number of patients in each diagnostic category is shown here. So the solid bars are the patients that, had, that survived, uh, sorry, the solid bars are patients that people that had cardiac activity, and the white bars are pe people that didn't. So that's the pseudo-PEA versus the true PEA. And the number surviving to admissions in the clear bars. So you can see that the pseudo-PEA was associated with increased survival to hospital admission when compared to true PEA, because the difference between the bars, between the black and the, gray, black and the white, is less uh, for every indication. Now, in all cases undergoing CPR in this study, they found that at least one echo window was effective in imaging the heart and providing useful diagnostic Im uh, information. Now, again, like I said, this was a pre-hospital study. It wasn't randomized. 
And it was just for survival to admission, not for survival to discharge, and certainly not for any kind of neuro outcomes. And I find it personally kind of difficult to believe that 100% of their images were useful or that they were able, even able to generate good views. And unfortunately, although they call it a protocol, they don't actually say in what order to do the views. They just say either do a Pariston long or, or do a subxiphoid. So the only perspective randomized trial in an ED setting was published in the highly respected Chinese Journal of Traumatology, a journal I'm sure you all read every month. And I'm really sad Ian's not here because if he read this article, he would have a stroke. He would not survive. There is no table one comparing population characteristics. I have no idea what percent were medical versus traumatic arrests, although certainly the name of the journal is pretty suggestive. And all in all, it's just an unholy mess. So for what it's worth, we'll go through it quickly. This was a prospective interventional study at two academic hospitals in Iran. It was a convenient sample of about 100 patients presenting with PEA, cardiac arrest, randomized into two groups. So one group got POCUS performed by emergency physicians plus ACLS. They were looking for things like right ventricular dysfunction, left ventricle dysfunction, pericardial fusion, like the standard stuff. And patients in group B got just ACLS. So they found a non-significant difference in rates of ROSC between the two groups. This was 34 versus 28%. And for ROSC, based on pseudo-PEA versus PEA, they got pseudo-PEA had a survival of 43, sorry, a ROSC of 43% and the true PEA had a survival of 0%. So that's just compared with 51 and 14 in reason. Like I said, this trial is a, a holy mess. It's just awful. <laughs> if you're cherry picking this as being the only prospective randomized trial of point of care ultrasound and cardiac arrest, I think you're probably doing a disservice to good medicine. But that's exactly what the AHA did in their 2015 guidelines. They say that ultrasound may be applied to help identify potentially reversible causes of cardiac arrest but it's unclear whether important clinical outcomes are actually affected by this routine use. Their only citation was that garbage study I just showed you. And they go on to give ultrasound a class 2B level of evidence recommendation to consider its use in cardiac arrest. But this is with the caveat that it's not getting in the way of your otherwise stellar ACLS care. So when I say that, I just don't mean making your pulse checks longer. You need to be mindful of your CRM principles and other management priorities like access and airway. And even something as simple as people doing chest compressions getting confused when you're holding the probe there in advance or tripping over the cords on their way to switch out uh, rescuers. That's something that I'm sure a bunch of you have probably seen a number of times. So my takeaway for a ACLS with routine transthoracic is that unfortunately there's no high quality evidence regarding patient-centered outcomes. But it certainly seems like POCUS has the potential to identify reversible causes. And the guidelines say that you can certainly consider it so long as it doesn't interfere with your otherwise stellar ACLS care. So that's a lot of information. I want to just like take a break for a second and say that when we apply ultrasound to cardiac arrest, you should be cautious because you're not going to have the same information from a history and physical and routine tests that you otherwise would when you're working up a patient in emergent or OBS. It's a completely different sort of scenario altogether. So as much of a, an ultrasound fanatic as I am, we need to be careful that our enthusiasm doesn't outstrip the evidence. Ultrasound is often felt to be risk-free just because it has less radiation than a CT and it's quick. But the important risk is the chance of false diagnosis and the routine use of echo for patients in cardiac arrest may contribute to unacceptable interruptions or distractions during ACLS care. And those are things that have been shown to actually help, so we don't want to do that. So the second half of this talk might scare you, but it shouldn't. It's going to be looking at transesophageal echo in the eMERGE. I think TEE is probably the next step in resuscitation monitoring that will give you fast, reliable, clear images, giving re useful real-time information about our arrest patients. And yes, in the literal sense, TEE is technically more invasive, but it doesn't need to be more complicated. So we've already hinted at a few of the limitations of trans transthoracic echo in general, and this goes doubly for cardiac arrest. There's patient factors to consider, like it prevents a good image generation because of obesity, because of a distended abdomen, you know, a pneumothorax or subcutaneous air, wounds, trauma, bandages, all those things, even just patient positioning. You know, you can't ask someone to roll a bit onto the left side if they don't have a pulse. Variali and Maldonado found that their transthoracic examinations failed 20% of the time in arrest, and in other ICU studies, the, uh, the rate of failure has been as high as 40%, what seems to be primarily driven by the use of mechanical ventilation in uh, intubated patients. There's also practical considerations of workflow at the bedside, including space on the chest, because as you probably see, nothing is more annoying than a resident telling the nurses, I need to look with the ultrasound, when they're trying to do something like get an airway or you know, get an IV access. And there's other resuscitative priorities too, like we've talked about. You can't be compromising hands-off time for this. 
You know, how many, time, how many people in here have themselves struggled to get a good view during a code? Or how many people have seen someone struggle and then you're starting to get nervous about restarting compressions? The American College of Cardiology deems transesophageal echo a reasonable first test versus transthoracic echo for patients who are intubated, for people on positive pressure, people that have COPD or other chest wall abnormalities. Now, I completely understand that their indications are for appropriate use are usually limited to people that are, you know, the critically ill trauma patient, suspected, suspected aortic or valvular disease or myocardial disease. But they give a class one recommendation for the use of TEE in unstable patients on a ventilator or if you're getting suboptimal images with the transthoracic echo. So I know we don't usually like getting advice from other specialties about how to resuscitate our critically ill patients. A common sentiment in the room right now might be, you know, these aren't stable patients in the echo lab, these aren't stable patients in PACU. You don't know what it's like down here in the ED. Well, I say this to make the point that this is no longer just the domain of cardiac anesthetists or cardiologists. And this is demonstrated by the fact that the American Society of Echocardiographers even felt compelled to publish a policy statement on transesophageal echo in the ED. And the basis for this is the possible advantages of TEE. It's possibly the next step, like I said, that will give you fast, reliable, clear images. It frees up that space at bedside during uh, resuscitation, and it's not affected by those aforementioned patient factors like obesity and COPD and subcutaneous air. It should lead to shorter times looking for cardiac activity during pulse checks. And because it's left in place, it's e easier to get serial views so that you can compare it to your last one without having to struggle to find a window again. It also gives the ability to continuously monitor chest compressions, looking for both depth and LV compression. Now, some of you are probably saying, like, wait, what was that last one? So do you remember this? this you should, because it was like 15 minutes ago. <laughs> this is like a, one of those scenarios, again, where people have been telling us to do something, and we're not really sure how to actually do it. Now, I'm sure one of the really smart residents in the front row would be able to tell me what the 2015 AHA guidelines say about depth of chest compressions. Like, what is the, what is the depth we're supposed to go to? Pete, I know you know it. Five to six centimeters. So five, five, six centimeters, right? Chest compressions. Kind of sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? So this clip was generously shared with me by Mike Mallon from the Ultrasound Podcast. It's showing sternal movements during chest compressions. So this is what's called a mid-esophageal four-chamber view. And I'm going to break this down the image for you so you can actually sort of appreciate what's going on. So this is showing you compression depth. Now remember, you're on the inside now, and you're looking out. So at the top of the screen, that's inside the esophagus, and at the very, at the very bottom, that hyperechoic line is the sternum. So comparing the depth markers at the side of the screen, you can actually get an idea how deep the compressions are. And if it's too difficult for you to sort of eyeball it and say, yeah, maybe go a little bit deeper, you can actually use M mode, which is the push of a button, that sine wave at the very bottom, so not that bright one at the top that's distracting you, the one at the very bottom, is actually the movement of the sternum up and down during chest compressions. So you can directly compare the height of that sine wave to the markers at the side to tell you exactly how deep your compressions are. Does that make sense? Does everyone sort of follow that? It's not, maybe not a view that you're used to, but the, it's there. I think that's pretty cool. So one more time, I'm going to show you that image. You can see the sternum like moving up and down and exactly how many centimeters it's actually moving. So while on that same note of compression quality, you, we can actually look at how well the LV is contracting. And now this hinges a little bit on whether you believe in the cardiac pump or thoracic pump model, which is a completely different topic. But a few ultrasound experts actually advocate using a, an apical four-chamber view to monitor active chest compressions from the outside. So I don't know if any of you have ever actually tried to do this, but it ends up kind of looking like this. <laughs> so this is from my QPath. This is actually an exam that I did. Just to sort of make the, it was during an arrest, I, was, I had it in place, and I was like, I'm just going to scan it to show how ridiculous this looks. You know. so, it doesn't really end up being super helpful, right? So this is a transesophageal view of what would be considered bad compressions. You know, you're not really seeing a whole lot of sternal depth, uh, and you're not really seeing a whole lot of compression of the LV. So that's that big chamber that you see there. So to show you a different view, I'm sure you can appreciate that the compressions are better quality, there's better depth, it's closer to six centimeters, and you're actually getting, you know, complete contraction and relaxation of the LV. So I admit that these are all sort of very dramatic video clips, and it's all really based on physiological theory. But some of you might be curious if there's any actual evidence for the use of transesophageal echo in cardiac arrest, especially given the limitations from our previous discussion regarding transthoracic echo.
So this was a study by Van der Waal. It's, it's a couple years old now. It's almost 20 years old. But it's a study of 48 in and out of hospital cardiac arrests. There's about 50-50 of each of patients who could be attended to by the hospital resuscitation team. So it's basically like their race team, except they could go to eMERGE as well. The only patients that weren't in this study were ICU patients. So the authors found underlying pathology in 31 of 48 cases. That's 64% of cases using transesophageal echo. And they found that the use of transesophageal intra-arrest was to have a sensitivity of 93%. That's for identifying MI, PE, dissection, tamponade, and pap rupture. And these are compared to gold reference standards, which ended up being angiography or cath, or in a couple of cases, autopsy, obviously. Now, maybe most importantly, they changed care in 31% of patients. Patients. So that was like treatment decisions made after the echo uh, as a direct result of the echo. And in this study, they found that they had an 8.3% survival to discharge. So that's actually pretty good. Now, obviously, this isn't an RCT. There's no control group. And there's inherent bias in the patients that you felt comfortable, you know, with the race team showing up a couple minutes late and putting a probe down. So there's a few other non-randomized studies looking at TEE in cardiac arrest, which say roughly the same thing. That top study there, uh, they talked about di directly visualizing PE in 8 out of 25 unexplained PEA patients. And the bottom study, they found 81% of arrests had their management changed because of TEE. Now again, these aren't RCTs, they're in-hospital arrests, and actually the bottom study is in the cardiac OR. So it's not all that generalizable to our setting. But then last year, Dr. Robert Arnfield at the London HSC, so that's associated with University of Western Ontario, published a paper looking at the feasibility the findings and the clinical influence observed from the first described transesophageal program implemented in an ED POCUS program. So this is the largest series of emergency physician performed transesophageal exams yet reported. It's also the first known emergency department transesophageal program to be described. And it's the first time they've talked about this uh, in vivo use of a four view focused TEE protocol. So we'll get, get to that more in a second. Over a two year period, they did 54 exams for the indications shown here, about half of which were cardiac arrest and post-arrest. And these were performed by 12 emergency physicians. That's 10 staff and two residents. And they found that a therapeutic impact was present in 67% of cases. So that's mainly including changes to the quality, timing, and location of intra-arrest CPR. So this isn't talking about like telling someone to throw a needle in the pericardium. This is just improving your CPR. They found that they described things like a misplaced vector of force, they found identification of chest compressor fatigue, short, shortened pulse check durations, and identification of ROSC during CPR. All of those were described in this study. So yes, it's retrospective. Yes, it's a small series. And yes, there was no control group. And yes, it wasn't designed for patient-centered outcomes. But as far as the intent of assessing feasibility goes, I think this is very promising. So does this make sense? Are you, are you still sort of with me with the idea of transesophageal? You might be starting to buy into the idea that this could potentially be a useful tool. But maybe you're skittish about safety. I mean, this isn't something that we've been doing a lot of, and it's not something we have a lot of experience with. And it's not really like us to go like shoving tubes in places all willy-nilly, right? Right? Except it's actually our favorite thing in the world to do that. It's literally our favorite thing in the world. Except you just don't want to end up looking like this guy. Do you guys know who this is? Or what show this is from? Kids in the Hall. This is my favorite Kids in the Hall sketch ever. It's called Bad Doctor. I watch it twice a year. It's like my, my mantra. If you've, if you've never seen it, you should totally watch it. It's hysterical. So what are we talking about? Yeah, TEE safety. So there's all kinds of injuries that you can get, and most of them tend to relate to the GI tract, as you can imagine. There's esophageal and gastric lacerations that cause bleeding. There's the potential for dysrhythmia as you're bumping up against the heart. Uh, complications related to intubation, like the intubation itself, like whether or not you're doing that for all your arrest patients. Uh, and it's, there's always the possibility you can dislodge the ET tube. And, you know, the obvious things like oropharyngeal or laryngeal injury. There's even been a case report of someone getting a splenic laceration from getting the TEE, TEE probe put down, which is, like, pretty gross, right? You don't want that to happen to you. So the Journal of uh, American Society of Echocardiography has published this list of what they consider absolute and relative contraindications, again, most of which are related to altered esophageal anatomy, but also including things like an active upper GI bleed. So to give you some perspective of these numbers, reported rates of major TEE-related complications in ambulatory, non-operative settings are shown here. So basically comparable to the same as like an upper scope. And even in the critically ill patient, there's been a number of studies looking at the safety of transesophageal echo, and it seems to be a pretty safe procedure. 
Between those five studies that I've shown you down here, there was no cases of death as a result of uh, the transesophageal probe and just a handful of complications, usually related to transient hypotension or emesis. There's only one paper looking at the use of it specifically in the ED setting. This is a total of 142 patients, most of them being trauma patients actually, who underwent transesophageal echo in the ED. So there was a 12.6 rate of complications, which is higher than those previously described numbers I told you, like zero to three percent. And this, these numbers were mostly driven by respiratory complications and a few episodes of hypotension and emesis as well. But I'll show you again the results from our Rob Arnfield study. This is those 54 cases. There was no aerodigestive injuries at all. There's also some other emergency department specific concerns. You know, we don't know when their last oral intake was as we do for most of our patients. And usually for transesophageal, what they suggest is actually decompressing the stomach prior to the exam because the introduction of air between the probe and the stomach can actually make for worse views. And also, obviously, we don't know their esophageal anatomy unless, you know, you know the results of a previous scope. So you don't actually know if there's going to be some varices hanging out down there when you throw the probe down. But overall, I think the take-home message is that TEE is very safe, even in the critically ill patient. I mean, to be fair, we're waiting for more data from the ED population, but with the numbers we already have, it suggests that TEE, TEE, God, that's hard to say. It's like rural juror. is probably as safe as an NG tube and definitely more safe than a central line. So let's talk a little bit about what the actual training for transesophageal echo could be like. I just want to emphasize how easy this could potentially be. I know echo talks are daunting, and you probably think of this diagram when you picture a transesophageal echo. You know, you think of all the cardiology reports you've read that have all sorts of fancy numbers and pressures and gradients, things like mean transaortic pressure gradient and mitral valve. I mean, who knows what that is? You know, and that can be really intimidating. I've stolen a slide from Scott Millington here just to show you that of all the 20 possible TEE views in a formal transesophageal echocardiogram, you only really need to learn four of them. So that main line in the middle there is actually sort of like at the top going down to the stomach and coming back up. So you just start in the gastric, you start in the, in the stomach, pull back a little bit, and turn it right to get the rest of your views. So you only really need to learn four of them. And they're analogous to the views you already know in terms of image interpretation. Now, these are simulator images, but do they look familiar to you guys? They're basically the same as your, your normal transthoracic views. They're just sort of flipped around a little bit. Like, if you look at the midesophageal four chamber in the top right, it's basically the same as a parasternal long, but it's it flipped around a little bit. Or it's a, sorry, like an apical four chamber, but flipped around. Uh, you remember now, like, again, you know, the top of the views, at the top of the triangle, you're on the inside. The only sort of newish view of these is the one on the bottom right. It's called a bicaval view. Uh, but apparently it's like pretty easy peasy to actually figure out how to do it. So this is an easily translatable skill for image generation. And more so, I think maybe for most of you, it shouldn't be a problem for image interpretation. Now in the process of preparing this round, I spoke with Dr. Robert Chen, who's a cardiac anesthetist at the Heart Institute. And he teaches transesophageal echo, I think possibly even to some of the people in this room. Uh, and his overwhelming experience is that people say that they feel the learning curve is easier for transesophageal than tr transthoracic. And if you're still apprehensive about this, just try to focus on the idea that you're not trying to answer all the questions that a formal echocardiogram would either. We're not talking about trying to diagnose dissections or endocarditis, as appealing as that might be, and you know, that might come later. But I've shown here a table from Mayo et al. This is from CHEST in 2009 where they published a list of competencies for advanced critical care echo. And it seems daunting, right? But what we're really looking for is the same findings that we do now with T, 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 E. It's the, the same findings listed in the American Society of Echocardiography, ASEP, consensus statement regarding the goals of a focused cardiac study. We're just looking for the same things we always do with the transesophageal. We're looking for effusion, tamponade, global ventricular dysfunction, or maybe RV dilatation suggesting PE. Looking for a volume assessment, and the help guiding life-saving procedures. As far as implementing a training and skills retention program at TOH, we don't quite yet know what this is going to look like. Labovitz suggested that we need to acquire and interpret ultrasound images that represent the full range of diagnostic possibilities for our training level with a case mix of negative and positive exams. That makes sense. I mean, and we know from, positive, uh, from past experience that we need to have some sort of QA process for this. I mean, that's just common sense. So there'll probably be more QPath forms. We actually do have some idea how this might work. Again, Robert Arnfield at Western has published on this too. So after just a two-hour didactic lecture and a two-hour sim session, 12 participants, who, by the way, none of whom had ever held a transesophageal probe before, were able to retain their ability six weeks later. 
So even in Rob's study, you have to remember there was only 54 studies by 12 docs in two years. So that works, it up, works out to about like two per month for the whole program. So even for the staff that are in this room, if you're only working like one research shift a month, which is like not crazy far from the average for you guys, at best you might only touch the probe every like two or three months. So what are some ways around this? Well, the Sim Center has a transesophageal simulator. Uh, maybe we could design a course that interested providers take every two years or so. And there's already precedent for this kind of skill set, you know, for airway, resuscitation, for surgical skills. The continued, uh, continuing professional development uh, team is already a priority for our department, especially for infrequently performed procedures. So this would probably fall under that, but it's clearly something that requires further research. For what it's worth, there's also an online module available through U of T. Um, this is through their uh, Cardiac Institute, uh, where you can actually use like a virtual transesophageal simulator. So you can like advance the probe using your mouse and practice interpreting different pathologies. Uh, it's actually pretty cool if you go and play around with it. So we're basically at the end of my talk. I just want to sort of underline the bottom, like take home points. I think transthoracic echo is helpful in cardiac arrest, but it's not like the be all end all of everything. You know, just because you can see the heart, it's not some magic bullet that's gonna help you save everybody. It, it definitely has its limitations, but in my humble opinion, I think transesophageal echo is probably a better tool for this. You know, it has, a, it's a, it has a realistic possibility that it can function well in an academic emergency department like ours. You know, whenever, whenever there's a code, you know, with the exception of being overnight, there's always two docs that rush over. This shouldn't be uh, something that's outside the bounds of possibility for us. And I think, you know, although it's difficult to justify the resources of a transesophageal program, we have to, like, consider how innovative do we want to be and what do we want a 21st century resuscitation to look like. So just on that note, as a final point of reference, this is like a a pic of a movie. Uh, I actually got it from Francis Bakewell. He posted it on his uh, Facebook a couple of months ago. It's from the Library Archives of Canada. This is what ACLS looked like in 1922. I'm really sorry, like, the ragtime piano music is not going to work. I really hope it does. Maybe I have to push the forward button one more time. OK, I'm going to do it. OK, it worked. So just sing like the entertainer maple leaf rag in your head or something. How many of you, have you guys seen this before? Is it quite, oh, you're going to love it. <laughs> so this is a guy who touched a live wire. Uh, it's some of the most, if you watch the full video, it's some of the most incredible acting ever. And this is what they did for ACLS. Look at his face when he looks at the camera. This is my favorite. <laughs> they look at the guy fixing the wire for a second, but they, they pan back down to him. But this is what CPR looked like in 1922. <laughs> So I think the idea was that you're supposed to like perfuse the kidneys better or something. Like it's supposed to like, and for drowning patients, it's supposed. I'm not joking. Like this is actually what they thought would happen. But this is like how far we've come in 97 years. So I would just like, I would just like to see a little more advancement in the next like maybe 10 or 15 years than this. Okay, that's enough of the dude humping the other fella. So I just want to thank a couple of people who are instrumental in this talk going well. Uh, Paul Peugeot was my supervisor, and he was the one that like controlled my manic brain that was completely disorganized. Um, Scott Millington generously donated a time and some slides in his ISU perspective. Rob Arnfield and Robert Chen, obviously, for their studies and their insight. Um, Dr. Mallon and Dr. Dawson from the Ultrasound Podcast gave me some images as well. Brandon, some inspiration. Francis for helping me name the talk. Although, Matt Lipinski actually got the winner for Look Deep Inside Yourself. And Ariel for letting me practice on her earlier in the week. Practice with her? <laughs> earlier. <laughs> Just jumping there earlier in the week. Uh, so thanks very much. Uh, I hope we can have a, some of the normal ultrasound dissenters aren't here right now, so maybe it'll be a more respectful discussion than usual. Um, but hopefully we can have a constructive talk about this. Uh, I'm open to any questions, of course, and here are my references. You're not going to read any of these, I'm sure. So. Yeah. George, I knew you were going to say something.